Father, again, we thank you for your commitment, your promise, and your covenant with your people, starting with Abraham and through his descendants, and the fact that we have been allowed to be adopted into that family, into that, uh, grafted onto that line. We are so grateful that we have this history that we can read and study, and we pray that you would show us more of yourself, that we can learn more of who you are and how you choose to act uh, with and for your people as we commit ourselves to this study. Uh, guide us and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, today, we are looking at the patriarchs. That's not actually fully accurate, and I'll explain that as we go along. We're looking at the patriarchs plus some. Uh, Genesis 12 to 50. Is everybody, are you reading this as we go along? So that you're, you've got a sense of it? I know some people are like to say, Ron said earlier, man, they did crazy stuff back then. Well, yeah. You do have to remember that this, you know, this is over 4,000 years ago that uh, at least Abraham's part of it. And so uh, very, very ancient times. We'll look at that, that chart again shortly in terms of kind of where this fits in history. Um, outline for our class, of course, the introduction. Last week we looked at the first 11 chapters of Genesis, the primeval prologue. Today, Genesis 12 to 50, the patriarchs plus some. Then the next two weeks after today, we'll study uh, Exodus 1 to 18, which is the, the actual Exodus part, the exiting of the Hebrew people with God's blessing out of Egypt and slavery in Egypt. And then uh, the week five, we will look at Exodus 19 to 40, especially focusing on the covenant at Sinai when God gave his law, the Mosaic covenant. Today, we're going to look at the Abrahamic covenant and how that was renewed. And then on um, the week five in Exodus 19 to 40, we will look at the Mosaic covenant and the giving of the law. Then one week on Leviticus, one on Numbers. Week eight, we will spend the first hour looking at Deuteronomy and then have our final exam. And again, some, somewhere about three quarters of the way through, I will give you all the study notes for all of that. Um, this class, because this question came up earlier, this class does not meet on any day but Wednesday. Don't get confused about that. This class stays on Wednesday for eight weeks. If you're in Thursday's class or Friday's class, we'll talk about that tomorrow on Friday. So don't worry about it. This class, Pentateuch, meets on Wednesday uh, every, every week. Okay, we are looking, of course, at the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. We looked last week at Genesis 1 to 11 and the fact that events predominate in this primeval history. Primeval history means prehistoric which means before they were writing history. As I've said before, it doesn't mean dinosaurs. Most people, you say prehistoric, and they start thinking, you know, cavemen and dinosaurs. No, it just simply means before there was a written history. And uh, the four great events in the first, four, uh, first 11 chapters of Genesis are the creation of the universe, uh, and of humanity especially, the fall, the flood, and then the table of nations and the Tower of Babel. And uh, it affects all of humanity over an unknown number of years. Today we're going to talk about Genesis 12 to 50, and instead of events predominating, this is a focus on people. The orientation is people now, starting with Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people. His name originally was Abram, of course. We'll talk about that. Abram's son, Abraham's son, Isaac, Isaac's son, Jacob, and one of Jacob's son, Joseph. Actually, Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. Um, and we'll talk about why Joseph is such a feature there. Um, Joseph is not actually a patriarch. That's why I said this is patriarchs plus some. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the patriarchs. Joseph is just one of, the, of uh, Jacob's children. But the focus is the whole family of Abraham, and it covers a period of about 300 years from our introduction to Abraham to the death of Joseph, which is the end of, the, of chapter 50 of uh, Genesis. Is there a question? Okay. Now, we mentioned last week the key messages in Genesis. We looked at the first three of these four key messages last week, that uh, God created everything from nothing, that is ex nihilo, that God explained to us what is wrong with humanity, why we are confused, broken, lost, self-destructive, and unable to communicate. It's because of the broken relationship between us and God that happened in the fall. And that Genesis tells us there are consequences for disobedience and betrayal, especially betrayal of God's love. Today, we're going to look at the fourth point. The chapters 12 through 50 of Genesis tell the story of God's call and his blessing on the people of Israel. The children of Abraham is a sign of his love for all of humanity. And we know that because, as we'll see later, every time God renews his covenant 
With Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, every time he says, and through you all peoples of the earth will be blessed. That's us. You know, that's, that's not just the, the direct biological descendants of Abraham that are to be blessed by him, but us as well, all nations of the earth. And so, in many ways, this chapter 12 through 50 of Genesis answers the problem or addresses the problem that got raised in the first 11 chapters, particularly the fall of humanity. The fall of humanity, the existence of evil, the fall in the garden, the existence of evil that caused the flood, the Tower of Babel, the fact that humanity was driven by pride and desire for self and no sense of God at all, and so he had to uh, confuse their language and spread them out. From the fall on through Genesis 1 to 11, we, we see the effect of sin. We see the problem. The introduction of Abraham is where God starts showing us over a very long period of time how he plans to address that problem by calling a special people to himself through whom he will be able to associate with the human race. Okay? So we are going to today talk about God's call and blessing on the people of Israel as representatives for all of, all of the human race. As we looked last week, um, we have Adam and Eve. Adam's sons, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel, and then from the line of Cain, which was cursed because of his murder, after four generations, we have Lamech. Lamech is a very rough dude. He's the first one to, as far as we know, to practice polygamy. He says he killed a man for offending him, and he'll kill anybody else. He'll, he'll do 70 times 7 worse to anybody who does him harm. So very, you get this line of Cain, a very sense that, that they are very selfish, very... Uh, determined to get their own way, uh, not what God desires. Well, after the first two sons, one, one murdered and the other exiled, uh, Adam and Eve have Seth through the line of Seth is the blessed line of God. After eight generations from Seth, we have Noah, and God determines to use a flood in order to cleanse the earth. Noah had three sons. Uh, the three sons were Shem, who is the father of the Semitic peoples, uh, Ham and Japheth. Ham ends up being the uh, progenitor to the Can Canaanite people, Shem of Abraham, and the Semitic people. All right? So that's the, the genealogy, the, the sort of from a 30,000 foot viewpoint, that's the genealogy we're talking about. I showed you this chart last week, the major parallels in world history. You'll notice at the top I've got Abraham around 2100 BC through. Joseph's death around 1805 BC, that's the period that we're talking about today. And to give you a context for that, Abraham would have lived about a hundred years before Stonehenge in England. Now, we see Stonehenge, these big standing stones, you know what Stonehenge is, right? And think, boy, that's old. Well, Abraham was older than that. Um, there was civilization in the Middle Eastern part, or what they used to call, the, or what's called the ancient Near East in terms of the uh, our scholarly study of it, there was civilization and historical figures we could identify, etc. there before there was any kind of civilization that we can identify specifically in Western Europe. Stonehenge was the product we believe, we don't even know for sure, we believe of Druidic peoples and Druidic ceremonies, but we know almost nothing about that. When I say we think it was the Druids, we don't even know that for sure. Um, and so, we have a lot more information about what's happening in the ancient Near East and the civilizations that came out of there. Remember, as you can see from this, you know, from this list, we believe the wheel was invented in this part of the world where Abraham lived. Uh, cattle were domesticated. Pictographic writing began there. The, the pharaohs started a thousand years before Stonehenge, the pharaohic dynasties. Um, the pyramid was built 2670, the first one. Corn was domesticated in Mesoamerica, that is Central America. Um, around 2475. So you get the idea that we think of ourselves as being the descendants of civilization in Western Europe, for instance. Civilization in Western Europe was, was way behind most of the rest of the world. Okay. Um, give you, gives you a sense of the historical context for this. Bob? If you look at this sketch of the progress of civilization, now, it's not a sketch of the progress of civilization. It's the progress of civilization in this particular part of the world. Yeah, I understand. Okay. But it seems interesting that apparently God created Adam and Eve in a relatively primitive state 
compared to the state that we're in today. I mean, for instance, they didn't have Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> they had smart cars. Or maybe they did and they lost it. Oh, they were kicked out of the garden. <laughs> Well, the question is whether that was an advantage or a disadvantage. I yeah, that's but good. it just seems strange that they were, they were created in this relatively primitive state. Um, yeah, well, I think I mentioned either last week or the week before a great line from uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and we've got a line in one of their songs is, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. In one way you could say, well, they were very primitive. In another way you could say they had everything they needed, and everything was good. And that ever since then, since, since the expulsion from the garden, we've been trying to find some way to fill the, the hole that's in us. You know, we've been looking for, and so, you know, we do it with all of this stuff and all of these activities when, in fact, they didn't need all of that because they had everything they really did need. Um, and, and to a great extent, all of that stuff we've got, which we think keeps us from being primitive, is all, I, I really think, trying to get back to the garden. We're trying to find something else that will scratch that itch we've got inside, that will satisfy that hunger we have, or something. Um, and so, they had everything they needed. You know, they, they, they were living on the land. Uh, Ron first and then Suzanne. One, one item in there, 2475 BC, maize just looks completely out of place since it's so removed from the rest of the world. It is. In fact, I, that, I put that in there simply so you have a context. There is something happening somewhere else in the world. There were yeah. some evidences of civilization in ancient China as well, you know, in, in Asia. Um, but so many of the things really did start here in the Middle East, in Mesopotamia, and the ancient Near Eastern area. Um, and then some of the other things that, you know, there was a kind of writing that developed in Mesoamerica later than, than the ancient Near East, but we do have other other signs of advancement as we go along. Um, so how was how was that migration accomplished from the early years of civilization? Uh, was it migration? We didn't have corn until some until the I mean, in terms discovery of the new world. Of, of how did how did we go from Adam and Eve to, to how did people get there? To people in Central America. Well, I, I think I mentioned to you all that I did the National Geographic has a thing called the Genome Project, where you send them your DNA and they'll tell you where you came from, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, genetically, all people that are alive today are traced back to Africa. And they're able to trace that from Africa, peoples moved up through Mesopotamia, I mean through this, this bridge between the three great continents of the ancient world. Some went into Europe, some went into Asia. The belief is that there were connections at, at one point between Asia and Australia and between Asia and uh, the Americas, the, the, the famous land bridge. They don't know for sure about any of that, but that's the estimate based upon what they can tell about genetics. And so there, it was possible for people to make some of that connection. You know, it's really not very far, even today, from Asia to the Americas up in the Aleutians. You know, you remember the famous comment from Sarah Palin, I can see Russia from my front porch. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, those things are pretty close up there. And so, given what the climate may have been or whatever, people managed to cross over. Now, we don't really have a lot, of, we don't have hardly any detail about that. We can track the, you know, some of the genetics. It's also true that there are lines of genetics that died out. For instance, I'm 2% Neanderthal. Okay? Um, now, lest you think that that makes me somehow less, the average for, for people in the Western world today that is not African peoples, uh, the Caucasian peoples, is usually around 4%. So I'm less Neanderthal than you are. Um, but two lines of peoples, Neanderthals in Europe and Denisovans, which was a Neanderthal-like people in Asia, depending upon where your genetics are, you, you have some, almost certainly have some percentage, unless you're 100% uh, African lineage, people that never left Africa, you probably have Neanderthal or Denisovan, and they're able to track that kind of thing. Well, those, those were a humanoid peoples that died out. There are other lines, genetic lines, that have died out. And we, you know, someday it'll be fun to learn more about that. We don't know a lot about it right now. That's why they have projects like the Genome Project, to try to help us understand that. And I love that kind of science, you know. I don't want anybody to ever think, because I believe scripture is true, that I'm not interested in science. I really am. So, Ron? Uh, I remember in college, Western Civ 1 and Western Civ 2, is there an equivalent, there must be in, East, in the East, 
Well, you, yeah, you can study Eastern civilization. It's, it would be considered Asiatic studies, or you know, particularly you can study development of Chinese culture and history, that sort of thing, which is the largest one, or, or the Indian subcontinent. You can look at that as well. Suzanne, you, you have a verdict. No, Sorry. just thinking about Bob's statement, and in, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had everything mm -hmm. that they needed. Absolutely. And when they were sent out, they, as civilization goes along, what we have today is not only, I think, a, a um, trying to fill the hole, it's also a big distraction. Yeah. It, can be, uh, it can be a bad thing. It's a burden sometimes more than anything else. I agree, absolutely. Um, that's why Carolyn and I want to plant a garden. You know, we're trying to get back to the land. So, okay, you get a context for that now. Um, so the patriarchs: Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. As I said, Joseph is not a patriarch. He is um, the eleventh son of Jacob. He is not even the predominant line. I mean, if you follow a line of uh, descendancy. Assuming that we believe that, that King David and then later on Jesus were the primary line of descendancy through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then Joseph's not even that line. Uh, the line it continues through Judah, who is the fourth son. Not the first or second or third. They were all disqualified for various reasons. But the fourth son, Judah, is the one through whom King David and then later Jesus is descended. And so Joseph becomes a dominant figure, you know, as you can see, there's actually 13 chapters. There's more of this part of Genesis focused on Joseph than anybody else because he becomes a significant historical figure and he becomes a significant model of righteousness, which I think is important to us. And we're going to look at that as we go along, but I want us to be clear. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the uh, are the patriarchs, and about Isaac we know almost nothing. I mean, Isaac is just there and gone again. It's like the only reason Isaac's there, two things. He fulfills the promise that the, God gave Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. And then he's the father of Jacob and Esau. Other than that, uh, Isaac is kind of a non-entity, as far as we can tell, uh, even though he's one of, considered one of the three patriarchs. All right, well, let's talk about the outline for Genesis 12 to 50 first. I want us to start with the outline, and then we will get into some of the, we're going to sort of walk through the major events Look at some of the scriptures that record those books. We are talking here about the patriarchal history. And the primary divisions of the patriarchal history, we talked about last week, the Toledot formula. Toledot is Hebrew, and it means the generations of, or the family of, or like the NIV uh, translates it, the account of. There are ten different places throughout Genesis where sections of, of uh, passages are introduced or bridged between two by these are the generations of, or these are the families of, or this is the account of. Five of those happen in the first 11 chapters, what we looked at last week. Five of them happen in these chapters. So even though it's not balanced, it's 11 chapters in one case, you know, and uh, 30, 38 in the other, um, 39, I guess. The, still, we have five of the Toledot formulas linking them together. And it's surprising what some of the sections are that are considered primary sections, if you look at an outline, based on the Toledot. For instance, um, uh, Ishmael and Esau both would be considered primary points in the outline of Genesis because they, their lines, their descendants, are introduced by the Toledot formula. Isaac doesn't show up anywhere in consideration of a major point within Genesis. We'll see what that means. The first section, the first Toledot, it says this is the story or the account or the generations of Abraham. Abraham is introduced as the son of Terah, his father, in uh, chapter 11, the end of chapter 11 of Genesis, and then really comes into his own in chapter 12. Um, we first hear of his background, son of Terah, and uh, one of his brothers dies, so Terah and Abraham and Abraham's wife Sarah and the nephew of Abraham, Lot, they all go with Terah to Haran. And we'll look at a map in just a minute here, which is sort of north of Canaan, but quite a long way away from Ur of the Chaldees, which is where they started. They travel, they're planning on going to Canaan, but they settle in the city or town of Haran and then decide they're going to settle there, and then Terah dies, and then we get the call of Abraham. Um, and the call, very simply, as you can see, begins chap in chapter 12, the start of chapter 12. The call is, Abraham, 
Go where I send you. Leave your people, leave your current uh, home, go where I send you, and I will be your God and you will be my people and I will make of you a great nation. That's the first promise. That's the call of Abraham. Abraham says yes. And so he gets up and he leaves Haran where they had settled and he goes down into Canaan. He's not in Canaan very long before a famine forces he and Sarah uh, to leave. And so they go down into Egypt and there's a, a weird little thing twice. Um, Abraham tells the ruling authorities that Sarah is his sister instead of his wife because he's afraid that if they, if they like her, they'll kill him in order to get her. Turns out she is his sister. She's his half-sister. Um, Terah is Sarah's father as well as being Abraham's father, but with a different mother. So they're half-siblings. Um, and in, in Genesis 20, the... <coughs> Abraham explains, well, actually she is my sister, <laughs> since I claimed that she was. And twice he does this, where he, and then once Isaac does it with Rebekah, claims that his wife is his sister because of, they're afraid that back in those days, if somebody was powerful enough, they saw something they wanted, they just take it. And so they're being a little insecure about that. Then we have um, the actual formulation of God's covenant in chapters 15 through 22, where God says to him, uh, and in between that, I should say that Lot... Lot and Abraham um, are living together. They're, they're, Lot is almost like a son to Abraham, even though he's his nephew. But they're both so prosperous, they got too many, too many herds and too many people following them around, they can't both live in the same place. The land won't support them because they're hurting people. And so they split up. And Lot goes toward the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the plain of, of the River Jordan. And Abraham goes the other direction. Well, Lot ends up getting taken captive by the Canaanite kings, and Abraham goes and saves him. I mentioned that earlier, and that's where Melchizedek, this very strange kind of Melchizedek, this character, the priest of Melchizedek, comes along uh, after Abraham saves Lot, and then they end up with God offering the covenant to Abraham. And again, the covenant had two aspects. If you will serve me and be my guy, then I will do two things for you. I will make you the father of a great nation. He takes him outside and says, look up. Look at the stars, Abraham. Can you count the stars? That's how many descendants I'll give you. Like the sands on the seashore, he says. I will give you that many descendants. And I will give you this land that you're in right now, the land of Canaan. I will give this to your descendants to be theirs forever and ever. If you will be uh, obedient to me, obey me and worship me only. And Abraham says, okay. He responds positively to that call. He doesn't actually introduce the, the physical mark of the covenant until chapter 17, um, which is when he says, you will be circumcised, every male of your household, every male of your people will be circumcised, and as a sign, a physical sign on the body of every male that you belong to me. And it was at that point when circumcision was, um, was introduced by God that God changes Abraham's name. He had been called Abram which means exalted father. His name got changed to Abraham, which means father of many, which was a sign of the fact that he was going to be the, the patriarch, the father of the figure of a vast multitude of people, the father of many, Abraham. Um, and Sarai's name got changed as well to Sarah. So they established this covenant agreement. And then we have the end of Abraham's life in chapters 23 to 25. Um, it involves, within there we have a story of Lot being down in Sodom and Gomorrah and three visitors come to see Abraham. Apparently it is the Lord, or one of them is perhaps the incarnation of God. It's been suggested it might actually have been Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus that represented himself to Abraham, the other two being angels. Well, they're going down to Sodom to destroy it because of the wickedness that is there. And Abraham uh, bargains with these three figures and says, well, what if there are 50 people who are good people, righteous people in, in Sodom? Would you destroy it and just destroy those, those people? And they go, well, okay, for the sake of 50, we won't. Well, what about 40? What about 30? What, and he gets on down to, what if just 10 righteous people live there? And the answer is, if only ten righteous people exist there, then we would not destroy the city. They go down there. Lot takes them in. Um, they, are being, they are guests in Lot's home. 
the men of the city come and bang on Lot's door and say, send those men that are visiting you out so that we can have sex with them. Apparently homosexuality was one of the, the uh, characteristics of the people there. Um, Lot refuses. He says they're, they're under protection under my roof. And he, he says a very strange thing. The character, again, this is a very ancient time. They had a very different set of values. He said, if you'll leave them alone, I'll give you my two young daughters and you can do whatever you two want to with them. Okay? <laughs> um, so, because Lot protects them, these angelic figures uh, lead Lot and his, they want to take his, his daughters and daughter's husbands. The husbands think these guys are kidding. Oh, we're, you, know, you can't destroy the city. So they don't go. But Lot and his wife and his daughters leave the city led by these angels. The angels say, don't look back because God's going to destroy the city. Lot's wife does look back. As a result, she is turned into a pillar of salt. And in that part of the world, there are pillars of salt that you see across the plains. <coughs> Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. And um, you get this sense of complete and utter annihilation uh, that occurs. Fire from heaven kind of stuff, where uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are both destroyed. Later on, after this in verse 21, the promise had continued to be coming to, to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. Um, the, because they get tired of waiting, they wait over 10 years, Sarah finally says, well, maybe God means, Abraham, that you're going to have a son. Not that I'm going to have a son, because Sarah's saying, I'm too old to have a son. Even though uh, later on she's promised, no, you, we need you, Sarah. But she gives her handmaiden, Hagar, who is an Egyptian handmaiden, to Abraham. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant and has a son, Ishmael. So Abraham and Sarah are thinking, okay, well, God is fulfilling his promise to us through Hagar's son by Abraham, Ishmael. But... Later on, when these three visitors have shown up, they say, no, Sarah, a year from now, we will be back. And by then, Sarah will have a child. And Sarah laughs. She's off in the tent. She's not in front of him. She laughs. And one of the guys says, Sarah, why did you laugh? And she lies. And says, I didn't laugh. Me? I didn't laugh. What's funny? And they said, no, you laughed. But it doesn't matter. You will have a son in a year. And she gets pregnant. She has Isaac. They name it Isaac because Isaac means he laughs. So Isaac is born. Sarah starts getting jealous of Hagar and Ishmael, who's like 13 years old by now. And she gets jealous and tells Abraham he has to, in fact, the funny thing is, Sarah says, it's your fault that she got pregnant with that child. You know, and I'm sure Abraham's going, what? You made me do that. <laughs> but... Uh, Abraham it doesn't want to send them off, Hagar and Ishmael, because Ishmael is his son, even though it's a son not by his wife, but by his wife's handmaiden. But God gives him a message and says, no, go ahead. Go ahead and send Hagar and Ishmael away because I will make of Ishmael a great people. The second of the Toledot formulas is, and these are the generations of Ishmael. Not of Isaac, of Ishmael. And God, you know, we're, we're, we're given the whole line here of all the descendants of Ishmael. He will be the father of a great people himself. Right? So, and Ishmael was a father of a great people. They are the Arabic peoples. Which is one of the reasons Semitic and Arabic peoples, you know, um, have never gotten along is because of the split between uh, when, when they, Abraham kept Isaac and sent off Hagar and Ishmael. Now, the Muslims see Ishmael as their heir. It was through Ishmael that the, the Arabic peoples, and therefore Islam, came. And they have very different, the Quran has very different stories about this. For instance, it was Ishmael that Abraham almost sacrificed. Okay, so they have a different orientation. Sierra? Um, when you were talking about the, the sending him away, I thought it was funny. I've never really thought of it being that big of a deal like that. That um, Sarah wanted to send them away, Hagar and Ishmael, because I was like, well, I would want the same thing, but like I was reading, like in our text, where like in the old, like ancient rules, I don't know if it was the law of Hammurabi, I think it was the law of Hammurabi, where it was saying that um, back then, they, uh, if 
the handmaiden had a son, then they couldn't send him away. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was interesting because I've never thought of that. Maybe that was a law back then, so maybe mm -hmm. that's another reason why Abraham didn't want to send him away. Yeah, it was. Um, it wasn't part of the Jewish law, but it was. It was traditional in that part of the world in Canaan in that in that time. It was quite common for handmaidens to bear children to the you know the head of the family. Um, and so wives would give their handmaidens. And so what Sarah did was fairly typical. But in the, the Babylonian rules, you know, the law of Hammurabi, as you're talking about, which is the first written law that we're aware of, it did say that if you do this, if your handmaid bears a child for the, you know, for the main guy, you can't just dismiss her then. Because the fear, I think, the concern was you impregnate the handmaid, and she has a child, and the child's what you want, so you get rid of the woman. All right? And so there was some protection there. Um, but the biggest reason why sending her away was a problem was you're sending her away into the wilderness. No way to take care of herself. You know, the, you, you didn't, well, here, let me stop at the 7-Eleven and I'll get some vitamin water and then we'll be okay, all right? They literally go off and um, when they run out of water, because Abraham at least gave them a skin of water and some food, when they run out of water, Hagar sets Ishmael down under a bush and she goes off a distance and is sitting there sobbing because she doesn't want to be there when her husband, when her son dies. You know, they're off in the wilderness with nothing to take care of them, and so they're about to die. And God comes to Hagar with a vision and says, No, no, I promised you, or I promised Abraham, I'm going to take care of Ishmael, I'm going to take care of you. And so she lifts her eyes and she sees a, a well. And so she gets water, takes care of Ishmael, and they're all right. But the expectation was, I'm sure from the minute they sent her off, the odds were she was going to die. And so was Ishmael. So, it was a pretty serious thing. Um, there may have been some of the idea that sending away a, you know, a handmaiden who had born a child for the master was um, frowned upon, but as much as anything else, it was that they could very likely die. Um, so that was part of it. But the descendants of Ishmael are outlined for us as one of the major points. Um, and then, so we have in chapter 25, uh, the, the verses that tell us here are the tribes that Ishmael, the father of the Arabic peoples, was responsible for. Then the next Toledot is the story of Jacob and Esau. It actually is the story of Jacob in this point. Uh, you know, this is the account of Jacob. We have uh, initially the stories of, well, in between there, I should say, we have Sarah's death, um, uh, Abraham's death, uh, Rebecca is is found as a wife for uh, Isaac. Abraham makes one of his servants swear that he will not let, let Isaac marry a Canaanite woman. So the relative goes back to Haran, where their relatives were, or the, the servant goes back to where their relatives were, finds Rebecca through kind of a miraculous, miraculous circumstance, brings her back. She becomes the wife to Isaac. Now, that's about as much as we know about that. Um, the, until Jacob and Esau come along, and then Rebecca is in Isaac are a little bit of a players in what happens in there. But um, Jacob and Esau are born. Esau is the oldest. Jacob comes out grasping his heel. We'll look at that. We're going to look at some of the details. Um, and then over a period of time, uh, after Jacob and Esau begin to grow up, Jacob hangs around the tents. He's kind of a homebody. Esau is an outdoorsy hunter kind of guy. And one day Esau comes in from uh, hunting, and he's really hungry, and he says, give me some of that, that uh, lentil stew, you know, lentil soup that you're making. And uh, Jacob says, uh, well, then sell me your birthright. We're going to look at that passage. The birthright was the legal right of the firstborn to have priority over goods. The reason why Esau probably seemed a little casual about selling his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup is because the birthright while it was a legal thing, it did not, it could be superseded by the desire of the father. So the blessing was more important. You know, that the father could bless the younger son and say, I give you rights to thing, and then the birthright that was a semi-legal kind of thing, the birthright didn't hold anything. So that's the reason that Esau was probably so casual about selling his birthright, is because he expected he was going to get his father's blessing. So what does that matter? So he sells his birthright. Then later, Jacob also steals Esau's blessing with the help of his mother, Rebecca, who liked Jacob better. He was a mama's boy. So uh, then Jacob runs for it, fearing that G uh, Esau, and rightly so, fearing that Esau is liable to kill him. He leaves, goes up to Padan Aram, which is where Haran is, 
and lives with his relatives, his uncle uh, Laban, who is his mother's brother. And he ends up work, falling in love with one of Laban's daughters, Rachel, ends up working for seven years to earn the right to marry her. Apparently got very drunk at the wedding party, wakes up the next morning and discovers that he has slept not with Rachel, the younger daughter, but with the older daughter, Leah, who had bad eyesight. Okay. I'm sure she had a wonderful personality. But she was not the one Jacob loved. Well, he goes, what did you do to me? And Laban just goes, oh, well, you know, we don't usually marry off the younger daughter until the older one's married, so you get Leah. And he goes, well, but I want to marry Rachel. He goes, well, work for me seven more years. So he does. Um, in order to then, and he, he gets to marry Rachel then anyway, so he's married to two of them, but he has to work for seven more years, and then he ends up working six more years after that in order to gain the herds that he's been looking at. So, so he works for 20 years for his father-in-law and uncle Laban. Okay. Um, then while he is working for Laban, while he is out and traveling abroad, God renews his covenant with Jacob, a renewal of the covenant that he had made first to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob. He renews that covenant. Um, then we have Jacob returning home again, and along the way, he's traveling, and one of his servants comes and says, your brother Esau, who he hasn't seen in 20 years, after having stolen his blessing, or his birthright, then his blessing, that servant comes and says, your brother Esau is coming with 400 armed men. And Jacob goes, oh, whoa, whoa, this is not good. Mm -hmm. So he basically shows who his favorites are. By, then, by this time, he's had a dozen kids, Jacob has. His uh, nearsighted wife, Leah, who's not his favorite, has had six sons. And then Rachel, his favorite, is barren. She's not able to bear. In fact, it says that Leah was allowed to have children because she was not loved by Jacob. So because Rachel can't have children, Rachel says, well, take my handmaid. And she has two kids. Then Leah's not having any more kids right now, so her handmaid has two kids by Jacob. So Zilpah and, and Bilhah, you know, they have... So there's six children by Leah, two by Zilpah, and two by Bilhah. You know, so we're up to ten. Then Rachel finally conceives and has Joseph. And then later on conceives again, and she dies giving birth to Benjamin. So at that point, Rachel, Jacob's favorite, you know, his love, the love of his life, dies giving birth to the twelfth son. Well, they're coming back. Rachel's still alive at this point. Esau's coming. Well, he lines the, the, his family up in groups, all right? The handmaidens out front, because they're going to kill somebody, let them go first. Then Leah, and then Rachel in the back, okay, with Joseph. Uh, and then, but at least J Jacob goes out front. He expects that Esau is going to attack him. He goes out front, and Esau hugs him and kisses him and greets him as, a, as his brother and long lost brother. And he's so nice to him, unbelievably nice to him. After and J Jacob had tried to bribe him by sending ahead herds and flocks, and he just like, what are all these? And Jacob said, oh, those are gifts. <laughs> and and Esau says, I don't need these. I I got more than I know what to do with. Okay. Well, Esau says, um, Jacob says, well, we're going on to Seir. And, and uh, Esau says, I'll go with you. you know? He goes, no, 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 no. I've got all these little ones, you know, and the baby goats and the baby lambs and the little baby kids. And, you know, and so we're going to go slow. You go on ahead. And Esau says, well, let me at least leave some of my men with you, and then we'll meet you there. And he goes, no, 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 no. you don't have to do that. You said, oh, well, we'll catch up with you. Well, they go on. Jacob goes somewhere else. He lies to Esau after his brother has been so gracious to him. Jacob was not a nice guy sometimes. We then have, again, surprisingly, the next Toledot, the next the groups of, or generations of, the descendants of Esau. Yes, Suzanne? While we're still with uh, Jacob, is Judah Leah's fourth son? Is, is he the one that the line of David comes from? Yes. In fact, the blessings uh, at the toward the end of Genesis, uh, the blessings that Jacob, before he dies, that he gets all of his sons, he actually identifies. His blessing to Judah is that you are a young lion crouching. And so this idea of the lion of Judah comes from the blessing that Jacob gives to his fourth son, Judah. Okay. Um, in fact, you get a lot about their personalities by reading those blessings that, that um, 
Jacob gives to each of his children. So we have the descendants of Esau. Esau, when he was born, was very hairy, which is what Esau means, and he was also red. He came out a very red baby. So he was also called Edom, E-D-O-M, which meant red. He was the father of the Edomites. The Edomites end up being one of the most horrific enemies of the Israelites. When uh, After the, the, the time of Joseph, when Moses brings the Israelites uh, out of Egypt and they spend 40 years in the desert, when they then are marching north to try to come back into the Holy Land to claim it, the Edomites keep attacking. Even though the Israelites ask them to let them pass through, the Edomites keep attacking them. And they will attack them from the rear. They will like pick off the stragglers, the weak. And so they're really horrific in that regard. And they pay for it later on in the book of Esther. You know the book of the story of the book of Esther? Well, the bad guy in the book of Esther is Haman. In fact, may his name be cursed forever. When they tell the story uh, of, the, of the book of Esther, whenever the name of Haman is mentioned, when they recite this story every year, the kids use uh, rattlers to, whenever they get ready to say Haman, they make a noise so that you can't actually hear the reader say the, say the name Haman. Haman was an Edomite. And so there's this long history of animosity between the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, and the Israelites, the descendants from Jacob, his brother. Okay. Now, they had other major enemies, the Philistines during the Judges and others. But there's something kind of uh, sneaky and mean-spirited about the relationship between the Edomites and the Israelites, more so than any other. Okay? Um, so we have the descendants of Esau. Then we have the story of Joseph and his brothers. The story is that Joseph, the eleventh of the sons, is a dreamer. In fact, his brothers call him a dreamer, and they don't mean this a compliment. And Joseph keeps telling his dreams to his brothers. He said, my brothers, I had a dream, and each of us had a shock of wheat, and, um, this, and uh, mine stood up straight, and all your others bowed down to me. And they went, yeah, like, right, <laughs> brother number eleven. Okay. And Benjamin was just very young at that point. He, he says, and I had another dream, and the sun and the moon and 11 stars all bowed down to me, which meant his father and his mother and his 11 brothers. And they went, you like, right. Well, Jacob loved Joseph. Remember, he was the first son of his beloved Rachel, the woman he loved more, more than anyone else. So he gave him this ornate coat, the coat of many colors. Okay, It doesn't actually say it was of many colors. It just said it was very ornate. So it was very fancy, and it showed that Joseph was his favorite. Well, his brothers get so frustrated and upset with Joseph, who thinks he's so special, and who's his father's pet, and who gets all these special gifts, that one time, while they're all out herding, and Joseph is still fairly young, they're out moving the flocks around, because that's what you did. You couldn't keep them in one place, because they had to find new, new grass to feed on. Joseph is sent by his father to go out and find out where his brothers are. So he goes to Dothan and some other places, and finally finds them, and he's headed toward them, and they say, there comes that dreamer, and one of them comes up with the idea, let's kill him. That's how much they didn't like Joseph, the little snitch, because he apparently had told on them when they'd done something wrong, too. And Reuben, the oldest, says, don't kill him, you know, don't shed his blood, but what we can do is, uh, let's take him and put him down in one of these dry cisterns, these basically these rock cisterns, naturally occurring cisterns. Uh, just put him down in there, and we'll figure out what to do with him. So they put him down in there, and a short time later, these Ishmaelites, descendants of Ishmael, they're also called Midianites because they came from the land of Midian, but they were descendants of, they were Arabic peoples from the line of Ishmael. They come along, and they sell Joseph to them as a slave. They let, keep his ornate jacket, they put some animal's blood on it, give it, take it to Jacob, go, look what we found. <laughs> Poor Joseph. <laughs> And Jacob goes into mourning, thinking that his beloved Joseph has been torn apart by an animal. We then find out Joseph ends up sold in slavery in Egypt. He is sold into the house of Potiphar, one of the officers of the Pharaoh. He is so good at being a household servant that he's put in charge of the whole household. But then, as often happens in Scripture, a woman comes into the picture and really messes it all up. Potiphar's wife, I'm not just saying, it's not what <laughs> Um, Potiphar's wife really likes the way Joseph looks because he's growing up into a very handsome young man. So she wants to sleep with him. He refuses. 
she tries to force him at one point when nobody else is in the house, and he literally wiggles out of her grasp, and she's still hanging on to his, his cloak. She's so mad at him, she calls the servants and said, this, this Hebrew, who has been in here as a servant, had came in and tried to make sport of me, to rape her, she said plain, and see, I grabbed his jacket as he, as he got away. She tells her husband, her husband has him thrown into prison for something he did not do. And by the way, when Potiphar's wife is asking Joseph to sleep with her, he says, I've been entrusted as, as the manager of this whole household. How could I do something, you know, now to violate the trust of my, of my boss, your husband? And more than that, how could I commit such a sin against God? So even though Joseph had been a little less than sensible in telling his dreams to his brothers, he grows up into a man of, of significant moral character, and that moral character he attributes to obedience to God and what God wants him to do. So he becomes a model for moral righteousness when most of his brothers were not. Okay, we have some very bad stories about some of them, like Judah sleeping with who he thinks is a prostitute. It turns out it's his daughter-in-law, you know, and, and you know she has two twin sons by her father-in-law, Judah. You know, so there's all kinds of messy stuff going on here. Some of the crazy things I think Ron was talking about. Bob? I think all of this would make a really good Mexican television. Yeah, it's, I mean, there is nothing new under the sun, okay? But you get I, I, the first hour here. I'm wanting to go through this whole outline, and then we're going to go back and look at some of the details, uh, particularly. But I want you to get the whole story of what's going on here. So Joseph is in prison. When he is in prison, he meets two men who have been put in prison by the Pharaoh: the Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker. Both of them have had dreams. And Joseph, who has got a reputation for being a very smart young guy, they say, uh, you know, they're really troubled. And Joseph says, what's wrong? And they said, we had really bad dreams. He said, well, tell me what they are. He interprets the dreams, that the cupbearer's dream is that in three days' time, he is going to be um, found innocent and reestablished as the cupbearer to Pharaoh. Well, the baker hears this, and he thinks, this is great. So he tells his dream. <coughs> and Joseph says, well, in three days, they're going to take you out of here and hang you. You know, you're going to die. Um, and it turns out both are true. When the cupbearer is released, Joseph says, remember me to the Pharaoh. Tell, you know, don't forget what I did for you in telling you the truth of your dream. The cupbearer promptly forgets. Later on, quite a bit later on, Pharaoh has a dream that he can't interpret. And he goes... And his magicians, his court magicians, means can't interpret. And so he says, I wish I could find somebody who could interpret a dream. And his cupbearer goes, I, I have been remiss all this time. I was supposed to have remembered there was a young man who was in prison with me back when I was out of your favor, Pharaoh, who interpreted my dream correctly, that I would be reestablished as your cupbearer. And so they call Joseph in. And Pharaoh tells him his dream. He had a dream of seven healthy cows that came up out of the Nile, and then seven scrawny, ugly cows came up out of the Nile, and the seven scrawny, ugly cows ate the seven healthy cows. And then he had the same, another dream, seven healthy heads of wheat that are eaten by seven scrawny, awful, ugly heads of wheat. Joseph says, no man can interpret your dream. This is the same thing Daniel says, by the way, but God can. And here is what your dream means, O Pharaoh. Seven years of plenty, Wonderful harvest will be followed by seven years of famine. And the seven years of famine will be so devastating that, that the whole region will suffer. And so what Pharaoh has to do, Joseph says, is to collect all the grain you can in the seven good years and have it available so that you can survive the seven bad years. And Pharaoh says, that's a really good idea, and it's a really good interpretation of the dream. And I don't know anybody smarter than you, Joseph, so why don't you do that for us? Why don't you run to Egypt for us and collect up all the grain and make sure it's available? He puts Joseph number two in all of Egypt, which was the most powerful country in the world at that time. Joseph is there. Comes true, seven years of plenty, he gathers up all this grain from everybody, sets up the system to do that. Seven years of famine. During the seven years of famine, which affected the whole eastern Mediterranean, the ancient Near East, Jacob and his sons and their families back in Canaan are suffering from the famine. And Jacob says, I hear they have grain down in Egypt. Why don't you boys go down and see if you can get some for us? Because we're starving. They go down. They don't recognize Joseph since he's the one in charge of distributing or selling grain, but he recognizes them. He talks to them, he doesn't let them know who he is, he hides his identity, 
He sends them back with grain and also puts the money that they had offered to pay for the grain back in their, in their uh, saddlebags. They get halfway back and they open their saddlebags and go, holy moly, here's the money. They're going to think we stole this stuff. They go back to Jacob. Later on, they run out of grain. They go back down to buy more. But they had told, uh, Joseph had told them, do you have any other brothers? And they go, well, one's dead. That's Joseph. They thought he was dead by this time. And then our younger brother. Benjamin was the full brother of Joseph, and so he wants to see him. So he says, well, if you ever come back, you better bring your youngest brother. They come back down. Eventually, Joseph can't stand it anymore. He reveals himself to him. They're scared to death. Remember, they sold him off into slavery after barely deciding not to kill him. But he welcomes them and blesses them and eventually sends for Jacob and the whole tribe. At that point, it's about 70 people come down to Egypt and live in the land of Goshen, which is the, one of the richest parts. They are sheep herders and cattle herders because the Egyptians thought that was, you know, nobody wanted to do that anyway, and they were good at it. So under Joseph, they come in, they are blessed, they're given a home, everything is good. Jacob eventually dies after blessing his children. When Jacob dies, the brothers are especially scared. They go, now that our father's dead, Joseph's got probably going to be mad. He's going to take it out on us after all. So they go and make up a story about how... By the way, Joseph, before our father Jacob died, he said to tell you, you should be nice to us. You know, uh, don't, don't be mad, don't be mean. And Joseph says one of the most beautiful things ever. He says, oh, guys, calm down, don't worry about it. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Again, Joseph always, not only is he moral, he always maintains a perspective in which God is in control, even when things are going very bad for him. His focus is on God. Eventually, Joseph dies. The end of the 50th chapter of Genesis is the death of Joseph. But the Israelites are there now. They're prospering. They're growing. They are, they are honored in Egypt. Everything is good. That's the story of Genesis 12 to 50. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Believe it or not, there's other things I didn't get into. But, uh, and, but you get the idea. Okay? I'm, we're going to take a break now, and then we're going to come back and we're going to look at some of these high points, like the call of Abraham, the renewal of the covenant to Isaac and of Jacob, and uh, some of the awful things Jacob did with his kid, etc. So, let's take a break. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, some of the major events here and look at the scripture. The first event, which is the start of chapter 12, is the call and covenant with Abraham. Now, the official, sort of official covenant comes a little bit later, chapter 15. But um, starting in, in the first verse of chapter 12, the Lord had said to Abram, notice his name is still Abram, which means exalted father, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And here it is. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, Lot his nephew. When Abram was 99 years old, um, I'm, I'm picking up here chapter 17 because I want to just reestablish what the covenant was. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between you, between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, father of many. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. So this is two passages. The first one is the first four verses of chapter 12, which is where our patriarch story begins, where God calls Abram, uh, Abram to go where he will send him, and Abram does. And then from chapter 17, the actual establishing of the covenant with a more formal language in which the expectation is that God will be his God and will provide him the blessing of, uh, to be the father of many. And he goes on later to say, and I will give you this land that you currently see. Those were the two terms. So this is the call, and then later the covenant, to Abraham. 
I've talked to you before about palistrophes. This is the Abraham story from verse 12 to 22 in palistrophe. Palistrophe, you will remember, chiasm or palistrophe is a literary structure which builds up to a point and then comes back again. Where it, it creates, uh, there's a parallel, going out and coming back. You'll see what I mean if you didn't get that before. First, Abram is called to the faith and is given the promise of a seed, that he will have many descendants. This is in chapter 12, the first nine verses. Then we have, starting in the 10th verse, the sojourn in Egypt, where because of famine, uh, Abram and Sarai go down into Egypt. And Abram denies Sarai, claims that it's, uh, she's his sister. Then you have the separation from Abram uh, of Lot in chapter, thir uh, chapter 13. Then you have the war of the Canaanite kings against Sodom and the kings of that region. Everybody was a king back then. All right? Every city had a king. Every area had a king. So one bunch of kings decided to have who, one of whom was the, had been the ruler over a lot of other areas. There's a battle between them. And so these Canaanite kings attack the kings of Sodom and the surrounding city. And Lot and his family and his herds and everything get captured and taken off. Abram takes his troops and goes and rescues Lot and all of this stuff, and that's where the Melchizedek event comes in. Then we have the covenant ceremony of animal sacrifice occurs in chapter 15, where there's the, uh, the restate, the stating, initial stating of a covenant. Then we have the birth of Ishmael in chapter 16. That's the pivot point for this palistrophe. Then chapter 17 is the sign of the covenant will be circumcision, the physical mark on the body of all males who are descendants of, or of, the, of the family or house of Abraham, which included purchased slaves and anybody else. Um, that is a parallel to the circumcision ceremony of with animal sacrifices, the sign. <laughs> the angels are playing here. Then we have the destruction of Sodom. Again, the focus on Sodom and Lot. Lot, in this case, is rescued not by Abram, but by angels. So that the angels um, take Lot and his wife and his daughters out of the city before it is destroyed. Then we have the sojourn in Gerar, and again a second denial of Sarah. Um, and in this case, Hagar and Ishmael, not Lot as the first time. This time there's a separation of Hagar and Ishmael family from, from Abram. And then finally, Abram's faith is tested in the sacrifice, the almost sacrifice of Isaac, and then the blessing of the seed. So there's the promise of the seed and the blessing of the seed. As you read these, you can see that this builds thematic lines up to the point of Ishmael being born, and then it reestablishes parallel points as it, as it recedes from that. Again, the Hebrew writings often have very distinctive structures built into them, which, because we're reading them in English and not in Hebrew, may not be obvious to us at all, uh, and yet we recognize that there is a, a, chiastic, a chiastic or palistrophic kind of structure. Okay? It's called a palistrophe if it has more than four points that get repeated you know, in a cycle. It's a chiasm if it's, if it's less than four points. Okay? This is the map. Again, you've looked at this before. The green is the Fertile Crescent, which really should continue down here on the Nile River, but we don't have much of Egypt here. This is Ur, right here. Uh, Abraham, his father Terah, and Sarai, or Abram, uh, Sarai and Terah, came from Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldees means the, it's the same basic as the Babylonians. The, the Babylonian language is Chaldean. So Chaldees means the area of the Babylonians. So Ur of the Chaldees, they went up here to Haran, which is in an area which is not listed on this map, which is called Padanaram. That's where Terah dies, and that's where they're living when Abram gets the call of God to go where he will take him, and where he takes him is down here to Canaan, to an area very near Jericho and Jerusalem, down near Shechem. Okay? And then from there they go down into Egypt and come back. I have a couple of other maps here. It's kind of hard to read because this doesn't reproduce all that well. But God tells Abram to go to Canaan. He travels from his home with Terah, his father, from Ur, down here in Sumer, in Mesopotamia. This is the land between the rivers. Up here to Haran, and then when God gives his call to Abram, Abram goes down here to Shechem, down in the land of Canaan. Okay? The 
next map is what happens later after you know after they're down in Abram goes down into Egypt with Sarai they come back there's a lot of running around uh, this these lines the blue dotted line is the root of the kings of, of Canaan as they had a campaign of battle that's where Lot gets captured Abram goes back and frees Lot etc so you can see all of these different red dots here and online you can I'm not going to go into detail what all these places are but you can see the place names that this is where all of the activity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob occurs. All right? Question. Yes. Does um, Abram have two calls? I seem to remember reading that uh, uh, God called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and they went up to Har Haran? Har Haran. Haran. They went up to Haran with his father and there they stayed until he died. And then he, then another call? No, we'll keep going. And then God called him again to continue on. See, so, yeah, the, the way they got to Haran was not by a call of God, unless, unless it's just not recorded. Because what we have here, starting in verse 27 of the 11th chapter, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Ter Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. Together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. Then, chapter 12, we have the call. the call. So we don't know what prompted Terah to take his family, which included Abram, Sarai, Lot, you know, to, uh, to Haran up here. Um, there's no indication in Scripture that it was a call of God. You know, what prompted them? We don't know. Maybe Terah received a call, took his family, and then that's where Abraham received a call. Okay? Uh, here you have the, the line of descendancy from Terah and his children, Haran, Nahor. Sarai was the half-sister of Abram. They married. That wasn't that rare back then. Okay. Um, the, genetically, they, there wasn't nearly the, <laughs> the, the difficulties that they had, and so it was fairly common. In fact, in royal families, it was very common for people to marry their sisters or brothers in order to keep the bloodline pure, they thought. And then Hagar was the handmaiden of Sarai. So Abram's first child was with Hagar, the Egyptian handmaiden of Sarai, and they had a son Ishmael, who was the father of the Arab peoples and of 12 tribes. When Ishmael was 12 or 13 thereabouts, um, Abram and Sarai finally have a son in their old age who is Isaac. Because Abram is, uh, by that time, is called Abraham, Abraham does not want Isaac to marry any of the Canaanite women where they are, so they, he sends a servant back over to, to Haran. Haran is the name of a person and of a place. Don't confuse that. Haran is the town, but then one of the, one of the children of Terah is called Haran. Um, and the, they find there a daughter of Bethuel, who is a um, grandson of Terah, Rebekah, Isaac and Rebekah are married. They have twin sons, Esau, who becomes, who's the older, who becomes the father of the Edomite peoples, and Jacob, who is the father of the Israelite people. Jacob ends up with two wives, first Leah, uh, and then Rachel, who's the one he really wanted in the first place. Leah ends up having six sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and then one daughter, Dinah. There may have been other daughters. They don't always list them. Then, um, Rachel's still unable to conceive, so Zilpah and Bilhah, two handmaids of Leah and Rachel, have two sons each, Gad and Asher from Zilpah, Bilhah's sons Dan and Naphtali, and then finally Rachel conceives Joseph, the eleventh son, and the twelfth son Benjamin is born and uh, Rachel dies in childbirth. The red are the people who are direct biological lineage leading to King David and to Jesus. Okay. So all of these people contributed, you know, relatives that led to the line of Judah, but particularly Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, 
and Leah, who came from another line of Terah, and Judah, the fourth son, who would lead to King David and Jesus. Clear? Questions about any of that? It was a man's world. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, but all you have to do is read the stories to realize who really was calling a lot of the shots. You know, for instance, um, Sarah tells Abraham, get rid of her. He doesn't want to, but he has to, right? So, um, yeah. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. <laughs> then we have, in the 22nd chapter, the test of Abraham. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Talk about rubbing salt in the womb. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Mount Moriah is where Jerusalem is now. This was before the city of Jerusalem existed. Mount Moriah is the site of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. In fact, it's recognized the uh, Christians and Jews, Jews and Christians, identify that the rock inside the Dome of the Rock is where supposedly Isaac was almost sacrificed. The Muslims believe that that was where Ishmael was almost sacrificed, and the Muslims also believe, and you can go there and see this rock, and that's why it's called the Dome of the Rock, is it's built over this huge stone, this rock. There's what looks like a hoof print on it, in it, and uh, in the Islamic beliefs, that is the place where, on horseback, the prophet um, launched in order to go up into heaven. Um, and so, when he's on horseback and he leaps into heaven on horseback, the horse left a footprint there, a hoofprint on the rock. So, they'll point that out to you if you go today. Anyway, um, <laughs> early the next morning, Abraham, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. When he reached the place God had told him about, Abraham <laughs> built an altar there and placed the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord got up, called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And of course they look around and there is a, it's either a lamb or a baby goat that's caught in the thicket next to, next, next to them. They capture it, they bring it, they, they sacrifice that animal. Now, this terrible thing that Abraham is called on to do, now it's likely that the reason I'm sure Abraham just tore himself apart over this, but he didn't. And it may very well be that it was because um, child sacrifice was not at all uncommon in the Canaanite religions of that day, in that region. And it could be that Abraham, when he hears this from God, is saying, well, this is just a part of God's demand that he has not told me about before, that he demands child sacrifice too. And while he wasn't happy about it, he was willing to do it because he'd come to believe this is the one true God. Again, doesn't mean he liked it, but it was God telling him to do this. So uh, he was prepared to, to obey, and yet was not required to. Right? Because God does not require child sacrifice. What he was uh, demanding is a show of faith. Yes? It says your only son in there twice, when of course he has Ishmael. Well, his only legitimate son, or legal son. The only son of the promise, Ishmael was born, and God actually blessed Ishmael, but Ishmael was a sign of disobedience. Because Sarah, especially, but Abraham went along with it, so he's responsible too. Just like Eve's the one that ate the apple, but she got Adam went along with it when she suggested it to him. So going along makes you a guilty party. Um, Abraham went along with it. So in that regard, both of them were guilty of unfaith. They, God had promised Abraham and Sarah, you will have a son. Well, after waiting a while, they decided that either God didn't mean it, or maybe they would try to figure out what God meant. And so Ishmael was not a child of the promise, and not the child that God recognized, even though he blessed him later. Yeah, I, I mean, he, he acknowledged him. So it's, it just seems odd to me that it says you're only sent in there twice. Yep, it, it does. It, it's very emphatic about yep. 
your only son. It may be that that's, that's God's way of saying, let me be very clear here, you only have one son that is a result of the promise. Mm -hmm. The other son is a result of disobedience. Okay. Here first and then Martin. Yes, Suzanne. Uh, he said he traveled for three days. Mm -hmm. And throughout, throughout Genesis, I noticed a lot of three days, three days. Yeah. Does that have a significant time? Well, three is a perfect number. I mean, that's the reason that we have tripods. It's because any less than that and things fall over and any more than that and it's a little bit, you know, extraneous. You don't really need more than that. So three is always considered a perfect number. It is the sense, the number of the, the Trinity. And so three gets used a lot. Forty gets used a lot. Seven gets used a lot. Um, it's also true that to the Hebrews, and this was this all the way up through the time of Jesus, um, when, and, and even Paul, they would always round up. For instance, if it took them just over two days, they would say three days. Jesus was in the grave three days. Well, on the third day. You know. um, the book of Acts says that Paul was in Ephesus three years. Well, apparently he was in Ephesus a little over two years, but because he got into the third year, they call it three years. So, yeah, three was a number they used a lot, but in this case it's probably more likely that it took him between two and three days to get there on foot, you know, pulling a burrow with uh, wood on it and, you know, his, his young son. So... Other than that, I don't know. But numbers do mean, mean something. In fact, there's a whole, you've heard about of Kabbalah, okay? Madonna wears a, the string bracelet as a sign of Kabbalah. Kabbalah is the Jewish uh, mysticism, is a Jewish mysticism, uh, kind of a mystic sect of Judaism, and they are huge on numerology. In fact, all of scripture, you know, every letter has a number value, and so every word has a number value, and they, they have a numerological interpretation of things based upon those values, and it, it gets a little weird. Uh, so, but numbers did mean something to them. Yeah. Okay? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, so Abraham had the son Ishmael by Hagar, who was not the son of the promise, but Isaac was through Sarah. Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, and, oops, and so this is where you get the direct descendants from Abraham. So the son Isaac was next. Let's look at God's renewal of the covenant that he had promised through Abraham to his descendants and how he renewed it with Isaac from the 26th chapter of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Isaac had gone and was talking to Abimelech, one of the kings, about the fact there was famine in the land, trying to decide what to do. So God's instructing him here. Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. Promises of a great people and the lands of Canaan. And through your offspring, here it is again, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commandments, my decrees, and my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. So even though Isaac is not a major character, other than being the child of the promise and being the father of Jacob and Esau, there's not a whole lot going on with Isaac. But he, God does renew the covenant to them. Guillermo, you had a question on your face. That's that again? Okay. So, the promise to Abraham renewed to Isaac, and then... In order to fulfill the promise that they would be, uh, that Abraham and that Isaac would bear, uh, would be the fathers of great peoples, we then have Jacob and Esau born. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? And so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. This is something God does a lot. Quite frequently, the younger child serves the older, even though it was traditional then for the older uh, child, the older son at least, to be the heir. 
When the time came for her to give birth, there were two twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Now, my brother Esau was a hairy man, but I, I am a smooth man. <laughs> um, Jacob, who became the father of the Israelite people, the Jewish people. Esau, who became the father of the Edomites. He's also called Edom because Edom means red. Esau means hairy. The word Jacob uh, means, um, the, literally means grasps the heel. And that is an idiom in Hebrew which means to deceive or to usurp. So the very fact, the very name Jacob, which means grasp the heel, has an idiomatic meaning which means he's a deceiver. You know, he's one who usurps the authority, which he does. He takes both the birthright and the blessing from his brother. He tricks his brother Esau out of his birthright by, as I said earlier, um, getting sort of, you have to think, kind of weak-minded Esau to agree to give away his birthright in exchange for a bowl of lentil soup. And again, Esau was thinking birthright doesn't mean anything. It's the blessing of our father that, will, that trumps everything. Birthright can be trumped by the official blessing of, of a parent. But in chapter 25, the legal rights of inheritance, uh, Esau tricks, uh, is tricked out of them by Jacob. And then in chapter 27, when Jacob is so old, um, I'm sorry, when Esau, when Isaac, this is all these names. When Isaac is so old that his eyesight is gone, and he's in bed, and he's getting ready to die, he tells Esau, go out, because Esau's the hunter, go out and kill some game and bring it back and cook it for me just the way I like it. Isaac liked Esau better. He liked his older son better. Rebekah liked Jacob, the younger son, better. Each had their favorites. Well, Rebekah hears Isaac send Esau out and said, bring back this game and cook it for me just the way I like, and I will give you my blessing. Rebecca goes to Jacob and says, okay, we've got to work fast. We need for you to pretend you're Esau and go in and get your father's blessing before Esau does. And Jacob says, but my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a smooth man. How are we going to deal with that? And he goes, uh, so Rebecca puts animal skins on his arms and his neck because Jacob's blind. And he wears Esau's clothes. And Rebecca gets some uh, goats, butchers them, cooks them as though they were wild game. Jacob takes them in, and Isaac, who is blind, says, Who is it? He goes, It's your son Esau. I brought you the game you asked for. And he goes, Well, you sound like Jacob. Come over here. And he touches his arms and neck, and he goes, Well, you're hairy like Esau. And he smells, says, Well, you smell like Esau. So he gives his blessing. The primary blessing, which is a blessing to be over, you know, your uh, your mo mother's sons, it says, and over all, you will be blessed by the dew of the earth, and God will be, you know, smiling on you, and all the good stuff. Jacob goes out. Esau shows up immediately with the stuff that he's killed and says, uh, my father, I brought you the game request for, and, and Isaac is shaken. He says, who is this? He goes, it's Esau, your son. He goes, but you were just here. He goes, no, I wasn't. He goes, well... I gave my blessing to whoever that was, Jacob. And Esau says, well, don't you have a blessing for me too? And Isaac says, you will be far from the dew of the earth. You will be a servant and slave to your brothers. And, you know, and he basically says, you're cooked. Okay. You're, you're, you're. And he says, well, oh, wait a minute. And he goes, no, I already gave my blessing because they considered this a divine thing. They considered this... You know, that they were speaking a word of prophetic power uh, in the name of God. And so he couldn't renounce that. And that's how Esau stole the blessing. Then Jacob runs for it at Rebekah's insistence because he thinks Esau's going to kill him. He goes back to Haran, up in Padan Haram, up north, and to his uncle Laban, falls in love with Rachel, says he'll work for uh, seven years for her, ends up getting tricked by being given Leah, Works, agrees to work seven more years for, um, six or seven, seven, uh, for Leah, or for Rachel. Then later ends up working six more years on top of that in order to get crops, or to get uh, herds. And as I say, then gets Laban back in the world's first, gen first genetic experiment. 
They didn't know anything about genetics back then, of course. But there's this fascinating story where when they start talking about herds and what payment Jacob is going to get for serving Laban after he's already worked enough to earn his two wives and gets the two handmaids in the deal. He says, all right, any spotted or striped goat or lamb, anything that's not pure or marked, because they, they made a big differentiation about that. If it was pure white or pure one color, then it was considered so much better than to be spotted or striped or anything else. He said, I'll only take the spotted and striped ones, which was like saying, I'll take only the least of them. And, and that wasn't many. Well, what he does is Jacob takes a tree bark and makes stripes and stuff on it, like strips off part of the bark and puts it in front of the watering troughs. And whenever one of the, one of the uh, ewes or uh, female goats is in heat, puts this thing up in front of the watering trough because they're looking at these stripes and spots when they're breeding, then they have all of these babies that are spotted and striped. Now, th this is not very good science. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fascinating that it sort of is a precursor to kind of genetic experiments that came, came much later. But the fact is that God blessed this, however it worked, and most of the progeny of these sheep and goats came out spotted and striped. And so Laban is having less and less and less animals in his herds, and Jacob is getting way rich, so much so that Laban's sons finally figure out something really bad's going wrong, and they get mad, and they're at, they start after uh, Jacob. He runs for it in the middle of the night, taking his wives and concubines and herds and everything with him, Laban finds out he's left and chases him down, and at first they have kind of a confrontation over stuff. Laban accuses them of stealing his household gods, which Rachel actually had done. She stole Laban's household gods and hid them under her saddle and then sat down on the saddle and said, I'm, when they're searching the, the tents, because Jacob said, look, look anywhere you want. If you find them, then I'm guilty. Well, Rachel's sitting on them on her, under her saddle, and she says, I'm sorry, I can't get up. I'm having my period. And they can't touch her because, I mean, she's unclean, so they can't make her get up. And so they get away with it. Which is one of the places, not the only one, one of the places that it suggests that the people back then, you know, not just the Israelites, but Laban and, you know, this is Jacob's wives who took the household gods, may very well, instead of being monotheistic, were henotheistic. Meaning they, had, they believed there was one god they ought to worship, but they didn't mean that was the only god. Henotheism means they believe there may have been multiple um, spiritual beings you could worship, maybe angels and demons, but that they were committed to one. So that's henotheism. You pick one, but you believe there may be others. It wasn't until Moses and the law, there's an absolute restriction that says, you know, you will have no other gods before me. And not only that, but you can't have any other graven images of any other idols or anything. And it's as though God is saying, I'm, the, I'm going to be your only God, and don't even pay any attention to all those others. Again, suggesting henotheism. So, Jacob is rich. He and Laban sort of strike a deal. He points out to Laban, I've worked for you for 20 years, and you changed my, my wages 10 times in order to try to cheat me. And I have always been good to you. I have always done the best by you. So Laban, they finally strike an agreement, and Laban lets him go. Then we have the, the um, in chapter 32, where Jacob wrestles with God, probably an angel of God, he wrestles until his hip is thrown out of joint, uh, and he limps after that, and that's when God renames him Israel, which literally means he struggles with God, okay, or he strives with God. It can either be against or alongside. And then Jacob is headed back with all of his new family and his herds and everything. He meets Esau, as I said. He expects Esau to probably kill him. Esau welcomes him as a long-lost brother. They're reconciled, and Jacob immediately lies to him again. You know, and tells him, I'll meet you there, and then he goes a different direction on purpose. Okay, um, so that's the Jacob narrative. There is also, as God had renewed his covenant, uh, his, the Abrahamic covenant, as we call it, with Abraham's son, uh, Abraham's son Isaac, he also renews it with Jacob in, ver in chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. 
he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heavens. Here's somebody in the background playing Stairway to Heaven. Um, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above, there above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And here it is again. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I will be with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Okay, so the renewal of the covenant, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. This is Jacob going up to Haran, up in the area known as Badan Aram, and then coming back down again to Gilead. So again, the activities are all here right in Canaan, Palestine, what would later be called the nation, the country of Israel. Once again, the, you know, just the outline, and you will remember that Sarai, and this is in Genesis 20, the 12th verse, where Abram acknowledges the fact that Sarai was his half-sister, same father, different mother. Then, when you get down here, Isaac's son Jacob, and then Jacob and his 12 sons and one daughter, and again, there may have been more daughters, but Dinah comes into play here. Um, Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. This is how he ends up in Egypt. And this is the passage. I've taken a number of verses from chapter 37. So Joseph went after his brothers. This is after Joseph had told the dreams where he, he was clearly saying, you guys are all going to fall down and, you know, and not, if not worship me, at least pay homage to me later. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. They were out with the herds. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. So these cisterns would have been natural hollows in the rock that they would use to collect water. Reuben, the oldest son, intercedes here and says, don't kill him, come on. Let's put him down in the cistern. We'll decide what to do with him. Um, so he keeps the younger brothers from killing them. Reuben is the oldest. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. Let's just sell him into slavery. That's all. <laughs> His brothers agreed. So when the Midian, uh, Midianite merchants, again, they were of the tribe of Ishmael, so they were Arabic, but they came from the land of Midian. That's why they're called both Ishmaelites and Midianites. Uh, so when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. And so here you have the uh, root of Jacob, and then also the root of the Ishmaelite traders. The Ishmaelite traders here in blue, having come across to Dothan, where they buy uh, Joseph, and then they go down here into Egypt. This is the Egyptian, the Nile Delta. All right. Now, while he's in Egypt, Joseph remains righteous, but is imprisoned anyway. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar, that's the official's name, Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day she caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. Yeah, you screamed because he got away. But... When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph is righteous. He, he remains moral. In fact, when the wife asked him, you know, sleep with me, he said, how could, I, 
how could I do that against my master who's been kind to me and put me in charge of everything? And how can I sin against God by doing that? So he's very righteous because he believes in God. And then God is still in charge, even though he's been sold into slavery by his brothers, etc. He's put in prison. He meets the cupbearer and the baker. He prophesies that the cupbearer will be released. The baker will be killed. It happens. The cupbearer promises to remember him and then promptly forgets him when he gets out of prison. And then later, when Pharaoh has two dreams of the seven cow, good cows eaten by the seven skinny cows and the seven heads of grain, good heads of grain destroyed by the seven uh, ugly, awful heads of grain, the cupbearer remembers. They bring Joseph. Joseph uh, prophesies or rather interprets for Pharaoh. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked him, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Talk about a promotion <laughs> from prison to being in charge of the whole land, the richest and most powerful land in the world at that time. Then Joseph welcomes his brothers down to Egypt. Remember, they came down looking for grain because the famine had happened, and Egypt had grain because Joseph had gathered it all up during the seven good years. And at first, Joseph doesn't reveal himself. The brothers go back, then they return later for more grain, and this is where Joseph reveals himself. Then Joseph could no longer control himself. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Sold anybody into slavery much? Okay. They were scared. Rightfully so, you'd think. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have, I will provide for you here because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become desolate. Then, after blessing his children, the next scene I want us to look at is the death of Jacob and the reassurance of Joseph to his brothers. This is Genesis 49 through 50, uh, into 50. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. I think that's fascinating. He drew his feet up into the bed. What must that bed have looked like? Okay. Joseph threw himself on his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father, Israel. Remember, the Egyptians were famous for embalming. They didn't just bury people. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. Remember, your father, our father too. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
So then, don't be afraid, I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph was not the primary line that would lead to King David and then later Jesus. But I believe the reason he is the dominant figure here, 13 whole chapters in uh, Genesis about him, is that he's a model for what someone who wished to serve God is supposed to look like. And a model for what God will do to those who are faithful. Right? It wasn't it wasn't Judah, even though Judah ended up being the line through whom David and, and Jesus came. Judah, who ended up sleeping with a prostitute, he thought, and it was actually his daughter-in-law who he had treated unfairly, who then had two illegitimate children by him. It wasn't you know it wasn't the brothers who sold Joseph off into slavery and lied to their father about it. It was Joseph, okay, who yeah was kind of a strong-headed youth and bragged a lot, but got over that and then was a righteous man. And so he's here. Both is an example of what it means to be a righteous man before God, and also an example of the fact that God will take care of you, which he did under very bad circumstances. Okay, I want to spend the last few minutes here looking at some major themes in Genesis 12 to 50. And I'm going to ask you guys to respond to examples from what we just talked about of each of these major themes. For instance, the theme of promise. Where in all of this we're talking about do you see evidence of promise as a major theme in Genesis 12 to 15? <laughs> Tom Cruise is going to come sliding in his underwear. Singing the blues. What's that? Singing the blues. Yeah. So, promise. The covenant to all of the children. Okay. The covenant to all of the children. God had made a promise even to Noah earlier, which he then, you know, Makes a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Sarah. You know, you will have a child, even though you don't believe it. You're, you laugh at me when we when I tell you that. <clears throat> Who else? Who else did he make a promise about? Or two? No, Isaac. Well, yeah. The covenant promises. Also, Hagar and Ishmael. The promise was made to Abraham that I will take care of him. Don't worry. And he fulfilled that promise, contrary to all expectations. Closely related to... Oh, that's wrong. These are out of order. Um, I rearranged the order and didn't change the automation, so sorry. Um, close to promise is the idea of covenant. A covenant is a more formal version of promise. And so, of course, the covenant promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what were the promises to them? Descendants of nations. Okay. Descendants. You will have a great descendant. You will be the father of nations. Nation. And what else? The land. The land. The land. The you land. will have a land. That's... That's why later on they start calling it the promised land. It's because it was part of the promise that was included in the covenant. And you will, be a, you will have many descendants, as many as the stars of the sky or the sands of the seashore, and you will have a land to call your own, which I, God, will give to you. And that was the promised land. Um, and that promise, the covenant promise, was to all future Israelites. You know, we have... There, there was a, a version of a covenant really to Adam and Eve. There was a, the Noahic covenant to Noah. The Abrahamic covenant. Isaac, Jacob inherited that. There's the Mosaic covenant. There's the Davidic covenant, covenant that your, your people will sit on the throne. We'll get to those you know, uh, future classes when we talk about David. We'll get to the Mosaic covenant um, in two weeks. But, and then redemption. What, is it, what does redemption mean? To forgive, to buy back. To buy back. back. Uh, would um, the sacrifice of Isaac be redemption because he redeemed him? God redeemed him from death. Right. He kept him from 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 killing, uh, from killing him. Another way to think of redemption in this context is means to save. You know, you redeem yeah, something, you, you you save it from whatever whatever it was going to be. You know, you, you bring it back. And in that regard, Lot and his family were Lot. redeemed. They were saved from the destruction of Sodom. Um, uh, Joseph was in slavery and was in prison. And God redeemed him. He brought him out. Okay. Um, again, Hagar and Ishmael. God saved them, redeemed them, gave them a future when there was none. Joseph saved his sons, I mean his brothers and his father. Very good point. Joseph saved his, the whole rest of his family. He, he redeemed them from, from starving and uh, gave them a home. And we're going to find out that generations later, it ended up kind of bad for the Israelites because that, that wasn't Joseph's fault. Okay. Um, then the theme of faith. What examples do we have here in, in terms of faith as a major theme? Okay, Noah. 
Well, well that was earlier, actually. Yeah, that was, I mean, you mentioned it was earlier because some of the promise was actually a fulfillment of something that was made in, in the primeval, the prehistoric prologue. But Abraham. Abraham. Oh Absolutely, the faith of Abraham. It yes. says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And that theme continues all the way through to Paul in the New Testament. You know, the faith of Abraham was the mark of what it truly meant to believe in God. What other examples of faith do we have? What about Joseph? The salvation. Well, no. <laughs> yeah. Joseph had faith that God was going to take care of him no matter how bad it got. And that's why he continued in his relationship with God. You know, he knew that God had promised that he would, you know, he would be great. And people would show him homage even when he was in prison, even when he was in, um, you know, in dire straits along the way. Um, he trusted in God. He had faith in God. Ron? Yeah, Isaac and Jacob didn't really seem to go to faith. Yeah, it's uh, Jacob. Jacob changed. We're gonna, there's another one here coming up that applies to Jacob very, really well, I think. But yeah, for most of his life, for most of the record we have of Jacob at least, Jacob tried to get get what he wanted by Jacob's effort, not by by faith in God. You know, that's, he was all he was the trickster. Um, but Isaac did have faith. He prayed for. Um to, uh, for Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca to have a baby. Absolutely. Yeah. He prayed for children through Rebecca, and uh, God answered that prayer. Uh, another thing would be obedience. Abraham was obedient in offering his son. Joseph was obedient, you know, to God rather than give in to the temptations and, you know, opportunities that he had. Um, also, sacrifice. Obviously, Abraham. Uh, but the willingness of the people to, you know, to follow God even when it was difficult. Abraham, the sacrifice of the almost sacrifice of Isaac, they always call it the sacrifice of Isaac, it was the almost sacrifice of Isaac, uh, was the ideal example of that. And another one, transformation. Jacob was the ideal one for that. Jacob, who, you know, as a young man, did everything to lie and cheat and steal, birthrights and blessings and everything else, um, ended up being the father of the, pe the, of the people of Israel. In fact, he was Israel and then his descendants. And he really did change, particularly the wrestling with God's scene. After that, Jacob still had some dark moments, but for the most part, he changes in terms of his orientation. And so there is a sense of transformation, especially in Jacob. And finally, sovereignty of God. Throughout. Throughout. The sovereignty of God means God is always in control, even when it's not clear to us how that is. And so Abraham and Sarah thought, well, yeah, God said this, but he doesn't seem to be following through. So they questioned the sovereignty of God, and God proved it to them. You know, you had Rebecca. It didn't look like she was going to be able to get pregnant, and yet God was still in charge of that. You know, Jacob thought he had to do everything by his efforts, and yet God demonstrated that God was still in charge. You know, God was running it. God's provision for, for uh, Joseph in all of those difficult times. The fact that he, you know... Joseph's beautiful statements about you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What, did, what is that other than somebody saying God is sovereign? God is a good and loving God, and He is in charge. He is control. The sovereignty of God bears through. So all of these themes, some of which strike people more as New Testament kinds of themes, but promise, covenant, redemption, faith, obedience, sacrifice, transformation, sovereignty of God, those are some of the major theological themes which we see very clear examples of here in the story of the patriarchs, Genesis 12 to 50. And that's why all of Genesis, the primeval uh, history that we looked at before, the primeval prologue, and uh, the, the story of the patriarchs, the founding of the people of Israel, really are the theological foundations for everything that comes later, including the New Testament. You talk about Jesus, you're talking about the fulfillment of a promise, you're talking about God having made a covenant. Remember in all, all those covenants, I kept pointing out, it says, and all the peoples of the world, will, or of the earth, will be blessed through you. That's a promise. And it was fulfilled in Jesus. The redemption of Christ, faith in Jesus Christ being the way in which we're saved. The idea that, you know, once we are saved, we are called to obedience, to things, if you, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, Jesus said. Uh, the idea that he is the ultimate sacrifice for us, once for all. The idea that we are transformed. You are a new creature. The old things are gone. The, you know, a new has come. And the idea of the sovereignty of God, that no matter how dark it seemed, or how, you know, during the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites, or no matter what else it was, God never has been out of control. It is always still within it. So these themes, which really 
are presented to us, even introduced to us in the book of Genesis, are the themes that carry through all the way to the birth and life, sacrificial death, resurrection, ascension, and eventual return of Jesus. So all of this is laid as a foundation from this book of Genesis. That's why it's so important to us. Questions about any of that? And there they said stunned for some moments. <laughs> Next week, we will meet Moses. And we will find out what happened to the Israelites. I think you may know. But if you don't, you'll find out what happened to the Israelites after Joseph was gone and some generations later there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Okay. God bless you all. Those of you who are in uh, the Life and Teachings of Jesus, we'll see you back here tomorrow.